Um, so hopefully you maybe made some mistakes and with the exception of these ones, which I wrote down incorrectly, uh, especially the negative ones. The negatives seem to cause the most trouble because they're negative and you have to square it and you got to multiply by negatives. And so definitely opportunity to get lost and make mistakes. Um, so I think I mentioned this earlier. If not, one of the goals that we have, one main goal that we have, um, when we talk about new functions, like polynomials, is to eventually graph them. Okay? It's inevitable. Um, and graphs are really useful and helpful uh, for trying to get an idea of what a function is doing and how it behaves. So do we have anything that would help us graph this function right now? Well, we get the value of x. That's the value of x. And what else do we have now that we've done this work? Y. What? Y. We get the value of y. We got x and y, x and y, x and y, x and y. We have a bunch of points that we can plot on the graph. So let's start by doing that. So uh, our x values go to 3 and negative 3. Um, and before I plot a point, I should, you know, I'm going to go over, say, to uh, 1, negative 33, or should I put negative 33, I should probably decide how big this y-axis is going to be, what the scale is going to be. So uh, if we look at our positive values, there's 43. That's in the positive direction. Negative direction, got negative 35. So that's way down there. So maybe we'll take it in tens and go down to negative 40. So we can get that negative 35 and maybe take it in tens this way and take it to 50 so that we can get that 43. Uh, so we'll start here. Negative 3 and 31. So that's 30. 31 would be right about there. Negative 2, 3. Very small. Get a different color. You can tell the difference. Uh, 3 back there. Uh, negative 1, negative 21. 0, negative 35, there, negative 33, there, 2, negative 9, and 3, 43, and about there. <coughs> All right, so we plotted some points. Yes. The quiz? The quiz, you want to start it over? Yeah, I'll just start here. Label this wrong? Uh, I did. I did chapter three. There you go. We're back. Um, okay, so we've got some good information here. Um, I just wanted to help you out as we graph these things and help you avoid a really common mistake. If we have a bunch of points, what we want to do is connect them not in straight lines, okay, so not that they're all pointy and jagged, nice and smooth, curvy, curvy things, uh, and also just work from left to right, getting every point. Let me show you what I mean. Um, a lot of times people work from the top down. Like I'll show you the extreme of that, doing something like this. It's going crazy. Okay. Just like the symbol of hope on Krypton is what they wind up with. And that's both well, not right. Okay. And you might ask yourself, well, how am I supposed to know that? For one thing, this is what we call a polynomial function. Okay? What's a function? We talked about it recently. A relation that has for every input one output. 
right? And a relation is the thing that go, has stuff go in and stuff go out. Input and output. And then a special thing about a function is that every input, this is the important part here, every input has only one output, okay? Does any part of this graph violate that? Yeah. How so? Well, the inputs are, say, zero, there's three points. There's an output, there's an output, there's an output. That's three outputs, we need one output. Okay. Um, way to make sure that doesn't happen is to realize that yeah. every, we can go out to this x and find this output, and if we went to this x, we would get this output, and if we went in between them, we get some output that's between these two. So um, we might be close to the average, but it's not going to be straight, so it'll be kind of curved, and um, yeah, we, we just want to connect it with a, a nice smooth curve, and we know that between each point is going to be the, the graph in between them. There's going to be some part of the graph in between this point and that point. So work from left to right, connecting every point uh, as you come across it in order from left to right. Okay. So far, there shouldn't be some, anything real mind blowing here. We put numbers into this function, we got numbers out, input and output, and we've connected them, and now we're, we're sure that we're supposed to work from left to right as we connect those points. That'll ensure that we don't get multiple outputs for one input. Um, okay. We're gonna, gonna ask this question, and it's gonna launch into a, a kind of a long discussion, but it's a really important discussion to have if we want to train ourselves to, to learn and to question and to think and to analyze and to think critically. Okay, so this is a, a big opportunity to think critically about a situation uh, and to gain understanding rather than having memorized something. Okay, so we can see that at, at negative three, we get uh, a positive 31. And then as we move towards zero, at a, as x moves towards zero, it gets closer. We're, we're going down here. Um, and at, at negative one, we're getting closer to zero now. We're at negative 21, and it drops down to negative 35, and a little bit past negative 35, and it comes back up, and then it goes positive again. It's at 43, and it looks like it'll keep going up. Uh, I don't know, at least for a while, we can see it's kind of come down and gone back. Might, might it go back down again if we keep going? Or is it gonna just keep going up? Okay, we can spend some time talking about this last class, but uh, I just think we're better prepared for this talk. So what do you think is going to happen as, as we put in bigger values for x? Are we going to keep shooting up into the positives, or could we maybe come back down into the negatives? Hey, Jesse? Keep going up. Keep going up, going into the positives. Okay. Can you defend that position? Can you tell us, these are the reasons why I think this. <laughs> okay. So he thinks it'll go up for no particular reason. Okay. Most of the answers are going to come from you today, so prepare for that. Yeah, you know. Um, it's because the uh, because the x is positive will go up. Yeah. X is positive. No, all this one's negative. This one's negative. Well, the leading. This, this one here, because it's written first, furthest to the left, is that what's important about it? Yeah, that's the highest exponent. Good, highest exponent. What do we call that highest exponent? The degree. The degree, the degree. The degree. okay. So we did talk about this, right? Yeah, we, we have talked about this already. Sure. So this will just go faster, and we'll have more time to do our homework. How's that? Okay. Uh, so that, that, that term, right, these are all terms. This is a term, term. This negative 7x is a term, negative 35 is a term. That term right there, furthest to the left, happens to have the biggest power, the biggest exponent, which we call the degree. Um, so what? Why do we care that that has the biggest power? He's just trying to keep us warm. Yeah, Connor? Um, as the x value gets larger and larger, that's important. it's going to increase exponentially. It's going to go way bigger than that. It's going to actually be not exponential. But yeah, good point. It'll grow really fast. Yeah. So when we say exponentially, that there's there's a, a real meaning to that, and actually we'll get to exponential growth later. But um, when 
me say when we say grows exponentially, we mean really quick, really big, and really fast. And that's true. This will get really big, really fast. Um, but so will this. One, and, so, and this will get pretty big, pretty fast. Uh, it'll get not, get not even close, right? Not even close to how big this is going to be. Okay. <coughs> so if we go into the positive x's, if we go this direction with x, then g of x will do what? Go up, right? Towards which infinity is that? Towards positive infinity, because when we're going vertical, up is, is positive. All right. How about the other way? When x goes towards negative infinity, it'll still go to positive infinity? Okay, why is that? putting in values that are uh, further and further into the negative uh, realm, and the negative x value, then you can try it yourself. It wouldn't take very long. If you put in a negative, uh, well, actually we had a really fantastic discussion last period, and, uh, and somebody brought this up. Just take a look at these two terms. These, these are important, but take a look at these two. Um, if we go into the negative value, um, this will be that number times itself times itself. This number will be, you know, that same number times itself times eight. Okay. So if we're putting negative numbers in here. We put negative numbers in here, we get negative. And when we put a negative number in here, we square it. When we square a negative, we get a positive number. Okay. At what value of x would these be like exactly canceling each other out? the exact opposite number. over 8x squared, so if these were exactly the same, it would be exactly balanced and one to one. Okay. Well, there's two factors of x here and uh, two factors of x, but then a leftover factor of x. So when would this be balanced out? When x is 1, or sorry, 8, when x is 8. Uh, very good, because these, these two factors will be exactly the same for both of these things. This will have 8 times 8, and this will have 8 times 8. This will have 8 times 8 times 8, and so will this. But because you're cubing that number, 8 times 8 times 8. But if we go, and we're in the negatives now, so uh, that we're talking about negative 8, really. If you go to negative 9, then, then you'll have negative 8 times negative 8 times 8, OK? Same as what, or negative 9 times negative 9 times 8. But this would be negative 9 times negative time times negative 9. So at negative eight, at negative eight, these two would be canceling each other out exactly. They'd be worth exactly the same. So exactly the opposite of each other. And then all that would be left is whatever this would be. Right? That's a little bit. Um, but once you go into negative nine, well, this would be bigger. Maybe it won't be big enough to, to combat whatever this is. But at some point, it would be, right? So um, I'll take the opportunity. To, um, to say something about calculators. I don't require calculators in my class because I think it's too expensive of a thing to require you to buy. But about now will be the time that I really highly recommend getting one because it just makes life a little easier. Um, and I want you to feel like you'll be left behind. You'll definitely have a calculator that you can borrow. I have it you can borrow long term if, if you really want to. Um, there's also, in this day and age, you can download this thing. I just found this free on the internet. The link is on my website. If 
you have trouble with it, let me know. I'll help you download it. Uh, there's also lots of graphing calculators via websites. One of them that I like a lot is Desmos. Okay, so if you go to desmos.com, really cool graphing calculator. Um, it's really robust and, and able to, uh, there's, there's lots of stuff to explore there. But it is really nice to have one that you can take with you. There's apps for your, your phone, so I can't let you use apps during the test because it's on your phone. And that's just problematic. But yeah, there's, there's lots of stuff out there. You know, if you want to spend some time, spend some money on a graphic calculator that's yours, um, I don't know if I highly recommend it, but I recommend it. Okay. In the days of, of free apps, it's hard to justify a hundred dollars for a calculator. But you can go to pawn shops and garage sales and all that stuff. Um, okay. So the cool thing about it. For one, you can do these long strings of, of computations uh, just by using parentheses and order of operations, just like you would if you were writing on a piece of paper. It'll do it all at once. Try to do it on a scientific is can get really old, right? You got a scientific, so they're kind of old, trying to multiply all that stuff together. And sometimes you'll write down a number on your piece of paper and then go back to the calculator and then bring that number back in, unless you're better at it than I am. That's what I do. I just kind of, I just go back and I use this thing, kind of go back and then put a different number in it. Oh, okay. Well, maybe you're a little more savvy than I was. Yeah, my, my stepmom taught me a lot about this. Oh, well, that's good. Um, but there, there's, there's one piece to it. There's also this, I mean, there's so much to it. This is the main thing about a graphing calculator is that you put functions into it, like this. This is a function, y equals that stuff. So... There it is, there's that function plugged into the calculator. Now I can go to the table, and you can see uh, if I do negative three, negative two, negative one, there's the table right there, I filled it out. And so that's, that's how I did that. Um, and then we can do things like, we just said neg negative eight would be where those are exactly canceling each other out. Um, so we put in negative eight, and we get negative eight is 21, okay? So, let's see, these things are canceled out. This is negative seven times negative eight. That's 54. 56? Yeah, I'm not very good at math, I understand it. So, 56 minus 35 is uh, apparently 21, right? Not too big. Okay, let's give a little more oomph to that cube. That cubed thing right there. We'll let it go to negative nine. Look at that. Just taking it to negative nine takes it beyond the point where all that other stuff could maybe bring it up into the positive values. So it's at negative 53. Okay. And um, now, if we go to negative 10, what do you think the y value is going to do from there? Keep being more negative, negative 10. Yeah, negative 11, negative 12. Do you think it'll ever come back up into the positive values? Well, that negative, uh, that Q is too big. It's, it's already bigger than this. It's certainly bigger than this, at least in magnitude, mm -hmm. right? Negative numbers are actually small numbers. But, but yeah, the magnitude of it is so big that these other terms cannot bring it back into the positive. They are changing it a little bit, but not that much. Okay. Um, this is already keyed up. I think you already saw this, but um, look at it again. We, we looked at this already? Yeah. Yeah. familiar? You can see, uh, oh, I got to change the second one to be eight so that we have that same polynomial. Okay, so we got x cubed plus 8x squared minus 7x minus 35. All right. You can see this point on the y-axis is 20,000, right? We're really, we've really shrunk down the y-axis so that we can see everything that's going on. Um, and I fixed it. I know it was broken the other day, but I fixed it. So you can see when x is 26, say, well, just the x cubed term is 17,576. And the final y value is 22,767. So not a whole lot different. If you let 26 or let x be even bigger. Let's shrink down that y-axis a ton. You can see how little 
uh, adding 8x squared changes it. You can go all the way out so that y is, or x is 100. And here, uh, this is a million. And this is just, uh, what, almost 80,000 more, which isn't a whole lot when you're talking about a million. Okay, So that x cubed term is, is just huge. It's the, the, uh, the boss of the whole thing, right? It's in control. So we know by, by all of that that this must keep going up for a while and come back down those y values now into the negatives. <coughs> so we just saw. Now we did plot some points in the middle, but what we were what we wound up talking about was just when x is really big and when x is really big in the negative direction as well. When x was really big in the positive direction, this x cubed would have been positive because it would be positive times positive times positive. So we see the graph moving in that direction. Notice I don't have anything in the middle. This has nothing to do with this in the middle. It's just on the right side. And also on the left side, as we move this way, that x cubed is going to be a big negative value. And eventually that big negative value will be so negative that the other terms can't change it all that much. Then, what happens when the number in front of the x cubed is a negative? If you cube it, let's see. Right now, x is a uh, hundred, okay. and we're going to cube a hundred, get a million, and let's say we make that number in front negative one. Let's see what's happening. Well, it's not a million; it's negative a million. And the more positive I make x, the more negative negative 1 times x cubed will be. Is that? Can you agree on that? Okay. Um, and if I were to make it more of a negative number, it would go even more into the negative. Okay. So now x is this big positive number. Let's go back here. Now x is this big positive number. And y is now going down into the negatives. What happens if we let x be negative? What's that going to happen then? What's going to happen to this y value? Going down to the negatives? Yeah, it'll stay there for a little bit because then the other thing to kind of take and take it over a little bit, but later that's going to So later, coming from the positives, but go back down negative? Mm -hmm. Okay. Before we, we go into the negatives for x quite yet, just think about if we put a negative number in for x and we cube it, what happens when you cube a negative number? Oh, it's going to be negative. So you cube a number, you cube a negative number, you get a negative number. And then what are we going to do after we get that big negative number? So now it's going to be positive. So those big negatives, neg negative x values, now become these big positive y values. Let's see. Oh, I can't go too far into the negatives. Change it, I thought. I'm going to change it. There's negative 20. Now we can go into the negatives up very, very far. And we can see how right we were that putting a negative into that term, we cube it, it's negative, then we multiply it by negative 1, and now we're into positives. Okay. <coughs> so as we move into the negatives now, for x, y uh, is this big positive. So when we went into the positive x's, the y's were positive, and when we went to the negative x's, 
the y's more negative. What's, what's the reason for that? Why when I put in a positive number, do we get out a positive number? If we're really kind of concentrating on this guy right here, because it's got the biggest power. When I put in a positive, it comes out positive, why is that? Positive times a positive times a positive is positive. Right? No big surprise there. Why, when we put a big negative x value into x, do we come out with a negative y value? Negative times negative times negative. Yeah. You get the negative times negative, that part's positive. You multiply by that third negative, it's negative. Okay, so when you cube a negative, it's negative. Okay. And since cube is the highest power, uh, our number is overall going to come out negative when x is big enough into the negatives. So the reason for that is because we've got the, a third power. Can you think of another power where that will happen too? You put in a big positive x, you got a big positive y. You put in a big negative x, you got a big negative y. 5, why 5? It's an odd, do you, all odd powers will do this? Yes. All odd powers. Okay, so we can generalize it. That any odd, well, when we see power, power is too general. What's that word for the biggest degree? degree? If we have an odd degree polynomial, then we'll see this happen, right? Put in a big positive number for x, get out a big positive number for y, negative number for x, negative number for y. And keep in mind, we're talking about big x's, not one and two and three, but 15, 20, 100, 1,000, a million. That's what we're talking about. That's why I don't have any graph in the middle because we're only talking about the ends. Okay? But this is also an odd degree. And it did the, the opposite. What happened there? Why was that? Because of the negative uh, one in front. Negative one in front of it. So the, the, okay, let's go back. The x cubed, or I guess it's, it's actually here. The x cubed, which is, since it's the biggest, it's the one that tells us the degree. The number in front of that one, in front of the biggest power of x, there's a name for that. Remember the name for that number? The leading coefficient. The leading coefficient. The coefficient for the variable, the variable that has the highest power. The variable that has the highest power, the coefficient for that guy is called the leading coefficient. And in this case, it's negative. So we have a negative leading coefficient. Stop having fun over there. Yeah. <laughs> ah, school. Who's doing that? Daryl. Oh, Zoom. Yeah. Morse code and yeah, sound like quiet. I got a magic trick. Some kid got a magic trick. <laughs> uh, no, you'll see it later. Okay. It's not so magic. Definitely an explanation behind it. So here we have an odd degree also, but it's a positive leading coefficient. Well, if we didn't have an odd degree, what other, what's the other option? <laughs> you can have an odd degree, or you could have an even degree. What's the difference between an even power and an, and an odd power? How do they act differently? It's flipped over. Even powers are always uh, even. They're never positive. They're never negative. So an even power will always make a positive number? Yeah. Why is that? Because it's twice. It's what? Because there's no negative in it? It's going to multiply that negative twice. So you multiply a number times itself an even number of times. So if it's positive, obviously it'll be positive. If you put a negative number in there, you multiply by itself an even number of times. Well, that means that you can group everything in twos. Groups of two. So group of two negatives, group of two negatives, group of two negatives, group of two negatives. Whatever it is, if it's an even power, an even degree, okay, the biggest power will be even. Therefore, the biggest number will always be positive. And so, no matter if we put an x in this positive, we'll get a positive. If we put an x in this negative, we'll get a positive. So let me state it this way, just to test your brains. 
Okay, so x is going towards infinity, which means x is getting really big. In that case, f of x, where you can think of f of x as y, what's that doing? For one that has an even degree. Bigger positive or negative? Positive. Bigger positive, so it's going towards positive infinity itself, right? So as we move this direction, as x gets to be larger and larger and larger, we're going to take that large number to an even power, and it's just going to make the y value bigger and bigger and bigger in the positive direction. As x goes to negative infinity, and we're plugging that negative number into a polynomial that has an even biggest power, an even degree. When you put a negative number into an even degree, you're going to get out positive. So g of x will go towards positive infinity. So x is going towards negative infinity, but y again will go to positive infinity. Now let's say we have an even degree and a negative leaky coefficient. Okay, so let's state it this way as x, just as a single x, goes to infinity, then g of x will go to negative infinity. Okay, for x, which is horizontal, we move this direction as we move towards positive infinity. We also are going to move uh, down for y towards negative infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, which means we're moving this direction, what's y going to do? Also going to go to negative infinity. When you multiply that thing that's always positive by negative, it'll always be negative. Why is it always positive? that even power. You take that a negative number to an even power, you get a uh, uh, positive. So it's always positive. And then if you multiply it by negative in front, it goes down. So we had the advantage of having already talked about this in the previous class to some extent. Hopefully we, we came at it from a slightly different angle. If you look on um, 5.2, 339, there's this little box, and it says exactly the same information as this. Okay. Um, the book just doesn't go, it doesn't really explain why. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking, that I, I hope what the author of uh, the book, or authors of the book, are thinking was. Well, they'll see this, they'll do some examples, and they'll start to see why the left side and the right side do what they do. Um, so instead of leaving it up to you, we took some time to discuss it in class. Um, and that's how I'll always challenge you to do is to think about it. Okay? Just think about it. So good discussion, do that made sense to you, and rather than having to memorize this chart, this information, and say, okay, if it's an even degree, a positive even coefficient, I know it does this. You just think about, well, it's an even power, and that's the biggest power, so it's gonna be the biggest term in this, in this thing, so when I put in a negative number thing, that's what's gonna happen. I know I understand. Um, okay, so let's do a, a great example of, uh, we got all this information, what are we gonna do with all this information? Right. So we're gonna graph the polynomial. Um, skills right now to graph a really beautiful looking graph, but we can graph a really good looking graph. All I want to see is that one, the end behavior is correct. This is just 
taking baby steps here, and uh, plot some points. At this stage, I already grade you. I would grade you based on those two criteria. Do you have the end behavior correct, and do you have some points that are correct as well? I think maybe I meant to write the word correct. Make sure you have that behavior correct. <laughs> I saw some slides with points. You want like some small and then some big, like on the reference. I would say let's do some smallish ones towards the middle because the big ones are taken care of with the end behavior. So you can also be, we can almost say like. Uh, this is for big X's. Big X's. Don't you want us to use big points so you can see if you got that in the you, you certainly should if you want to confirm that you're correct. Um, you can give it some big values. But if, if our behavior is correct, then we don't have to plot any bigger X values. Um, Another thing is, you can't be sure how big these x values have to get before they start go and the graph starts going in the direction that it's supposed to. Right. So you should definitely consult the end behavior um, above everything else. So maybe let's let's plot some points somewhere near the origin. Maybe like. Uh, Couple negatives, couple positives, like three or four points. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to plot seven points like we did on that first one. Um, so let's just pick some points. Probably easiest just to create a little table. Uh, maybe do negative one, zero, and one. Because you can never be sure that we've got the exact right shape unless we plot a ridiculous number of. So we'll just do negative one, zero, one, see kind of what the shape is, and make it fit the end behavior like we know it's supposed to be, and that's, that's as good as we can do right now. All right, so we'll do negative one. It's going to be four. That's going to be zero. Negative one times negative five is five. A negative one cube would be negative one, so five minus one. So yeah, yeah. Zero, zero. See, if we didn't know anything more about polynomials, we could connect this with a straight line. Right? These points follow a slope type pattern, but we know better than that. It's polynomial, it's not a line. It's gonna be this really curvy thing. So now that we have those points, um, we don't quite want to connect them until we know what the ends should look like. So as we move out to the right, will the y values continue to go down into the negative, or will they turn around and start being really, really positive? Positive. We got a leading coefficient of three. Okay, so it's kind of in control here of the big x values. We put 100 in there. 100 cubed is positive uh, a million. And then that doesn't really matter. So we're going to get these big positive numbers. So we should you know, make the end go off in that direction. That could just be a guide. It doesn't have to go through that arrow. Mm -hmm. We go over here. We put negative x values in there. What kind of y values are we going to get? Mm -hmm. Negative y values because we're going to get negative cubed is negative. So in that direction. So you get a picture. I see it's got to go through those points. It's got to have that end behavior. So I'm going to connect them so that happens. Like I said, it doesn't have to go through that point. That was just a guide to let me know that's the direction I should wind up going. Get rid of that now. And feel free to just go up past this highest point that you have, because you don't know that's the highest point that you'll find, right? 
I don't feel like you have to come back down with that, but if you did, just like we don't know that it is the highest, we don't know that it's not the highest. So, uh, either way. There we go, we've got the end behavior correct. It's going up and to the right, down and to the left. Uh, and we've got these three points that we're going through. I can't ask for much better than that. If you were, the only way it could get better is if you were to plot more and more and more points. Okay, but doing the end behavior and, and knowing the, you know, how a, a function is going to act helps us get away from having to do that. Okay. And then we get into the calculus and we can find things like where this highest point is and where this lowest point is. And even where it starts to, you see how it gets really steep right here and then starts to get less steep? We can find where that happens. Um, we can find all sorts of stuff with calculus about more exact graphs. But this is good. This is really good for now. <coughs> okay. Any questions about graphing our polynomials? Hopefully, we've done a really good job by you. And you get it real, real good. Okay. So there's one last thing that I want to show you is the magic trick. Okay. Let's take. This original function that we had at the beginning of class. I'm going to show you a super fast way to evaluate it for different values of x. Okay. Here's how it looks. It's got this setup. It, you know, it's a setup kind of like long division where you draw this, this shape and you put all these numbers in and you get it all set up and it's like the same every time. So here's the setup. You draw this guy and see if you can figure out where I got those numbers. <laughs> okay. Where did I get it from? We're trying to get a specific word out of here. Coefficients. coefficients. These coefficients, and this we could really view this as a coefficient, the coefficient of x to the zero, if we like. Or you can say the coefficients, the constant, whatever. Here's some important things about this setup. Uh, they've got to be written in order of the, of the powers of x. Right? So the biggest one has to come first and, and on down. If, for instance, let me uh, set up a, a different one. It's the same in every way, except for it's slightly different. Okay, You can see there's no x term there. So if I were to set this one up, I can't just go 1, 8, negative 35. I have to go 1, 8. There's no x's, so I put a 0 there. And then put my constants. You have to put a 0 placeholder if one of those terms is missing. Uh, you know, for example, this one, to set up this synthetic substitution, we go 1, 0, negative 5, and also 0, because there's no constant. So make sure you put 0 in there. Let's say we want to plug in 3. Put 3 right there. It's shocking. Bring down the 1. So always bring down the 1 as the first thing. And then like here's the, here's the part where 3 actually starts to become part of the process. Right. So take 3 and multiply it by 1. And then put the result right there. So 3 times 1 is 3. And just add these together. 11. Do it again. 3 times 11. Put the result here, 33. Add these together, 33 minus 7 is 26. And 3 times 26 is 78. Yep. 78. And then 78 minus 35 is 43. Do a harder one, like when you put a negative in there, that's kind of difficult. But the setup is the same. 1, 8, negative 7, negative 35, negative, negative 3. So still bring down the 1, and then we start negative 3 times 1. 
negative 3. We got 5. Let me put those together. Negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. Negative 7 minus 15. Negative 22. And negative 3 times negative 22 is 66. And we get 31. Negative 3. 31. Just a couple of examples to prove to you that it works. It's pretty neat. And I think it's a very clever thing to do to whoever maybe thought to do this first. It's a pretty clever guy. Um, if you're curious though, and I really hope you are, curiosity is my favorite uh, quality in a student and probably in a human. So the setup for synthetic substitution looks like this. And we can put any number we want here and do the same process to it every time. Okay. This is where algebra comes in really handy. These are the kinds of things we do. We notice that any number could go there. And so we represent any number with x. And then we do this. Uh, if you want to reveal the, the, the magic, the magic juju behind this, just do the whole process, but with x instead of with a specific number. Right? Then you'll see this whole process does the exact same thing as this function here, to whatever number you put. But I leave it to you. 